Today's guest on The Jordan Harbinger Show has been thrown into Russian prison, has a vendetta against Vladimir Putin, stays in the country, and is one of the most visible activists in the world. Enjoy this episode here on The Jordan Harbinger Show with Nadia Tolokonikova. So thanks for joining us in studio, by the way, right before your talk. I know that you've got, uh, you just got off a plane and probably had just gotten off a plane before that and you had a big talk tonight, yeah? Kind of. Kind of. But yeah, I think everybody lives this life nowadays. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, especially. In in the big cities. In, in big, big cities, cities. Yeah. yeah, probably. I know you don't do that many interviews and I, I watched as many as I could online over the week trying to prepare for this and I noticed that there were a lot of really there were questions where you could tell you didn't want to answer them so I'm going to try to avoid those but I can't promise that I won't get to all of those and that I'll skip all of those because some of them are pretty interesting in fact uh, f first of all being 38 years old I think I'm a decade or so older than you almost I'm 28 now yeah so what conditions were you in growing up that inspired you to be to grow into this sort of activism role? Because I think when I was 28, I was like, let me go to the bar, chase some women, go home, 28. watch a movie. Yeah, late bloomer, maybe. Oh, I don't know. I think Americans and Russians there are pretty different in this uh, instance. Because Russians, they're, they just have to grow up faster. Mm, first of all, like legally, you can start drinking just at 21, and we can drink at 18, and effectively we start to drink in 12. Um, second, I finished my school uh, when I was 16 years old, and when I was 16, I, I left my home, I left my parents' home, and I moved just by myself to Moscow. And I know that here you are supposed to study in school in, until 19. Yeah, and most parents would be like, oh, you think you're moving out at 16? Maybe to the garage, you know? <laughs> And I go to Moscow. My mother wasn't thr thrilled of me moving too, but I, um, I just collected money from lunches and uh, I, I bought a ticket. And uh, she, we're in good relationships now, but we didn't talk with her like for, for six or seven years after that. She wasn't she wasn't really happy. Yeah, but yeah, in general, people start to grow up f faster. I think. But it's changing. It's all changing. Uh, like we, we we can talk mostly just about our generations. But if you uh, take a look at uh, younger generations, like uh, pe people who are 14, 15 years old, I think it's true for both Americans and Russians that they're already like some of them. They're important part of the economy. Like they're, that they're making this. They're making money on blogs they're making money on slimes do you know what slime, slime is yeah, i do, do know, know what, what slime is, is. Yeah, have, <laughs> this blew my freaking mind when i found out that people were buying this crap i couldn't believe it do you know that like 10 years old kids are making slimes and making like thousands of dollars yeah like, more than more than their parents yeah like you like, will be lucky if this show and your book do as well as some eight-year-old kid who has a youtube channel <laughs> making slime no i don't think we can really compete with them i you know i was like uh, yesterday, I was happy as fuck, but not because my book came out. Because a girl um, from Instagram, I don't know, like she's, I think she's uh, eleven or something. She replied to me. She replied to me, and I wrote to her that I really want to buy this, like ten of these slimes, and um, taste. Uh, they smell really good, um, like American slimes, and she's from Russia, and it's like, a, it's a big thing to uh, have an American quality slimes. So she replied me, and I understood that it's just like, I, now I will have res some, some, some respect in the eyes of my daughter, who is 10 years old right now, too. So that's the only one way, actually, how to get some respect in her eyes. Uh, and that girl from Slime Instagram, she recognized me and uh, she started to like my um, videos of me performing at Charlie XCX's party um, the other day. And uh, so that was just an, an ultimate happiness. It's funny. That, and I don't know what that communicates about our generation when we're trying to get our approval from like 10 year olds who make things on the Internet. 
and they don't know who we are at all. Or if we're <laughs> happy when they go, I think I saw you on the news. Yeah, My yeah. mom was watching and I looked over her shoulder. Yeah. That it's kinda... like it's um, for me, it's connected with my daughter. As of course. I just, I just want to be a cool parent, you know, as a whole. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Yeah. You can be an internationally recognized artist and it's like, yeah, but do you make slime? Didn't think so, bitch. Get out of here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's uh, that could be that could bring you down to the level on the regular. Right. As soon as you get to fool yourself, just ask your kid what she thinks of your career. Exactly. I was like, yeah, Gera, uh, my book came out. Did you see that interview? Like that that, that interview with like one one Russian um, YouTube blogger. Actually, pretty good interview. Like m- m- it's over like million and a half views just in seven hours. Oh wow! And um, yeah, and uh, I I haven't seen this interview because I can't hear or see myself on like taped. But all my friends are freaking out. They're saying it's such a great interview. So I I asked my daughter if she's seen this interview. So um, she sounded really bored, and she asked me about slimes again. So oh, <laughs> when you will come back home again, and uh, will you bring this parcel right away? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, how quickly are you going to bring that American slime back? That's what I really want to know. <laughs> yes. So you're six years old. You're walking around with your dad, and you cross the street when you see cops on the other side of the or on your side of the road. Obviously, there's some kind of rational or irrational fear that something's going to happen. It seems like that might have been maybe the genesis of your, I don't want to say rebellious streak, because it's not really a streak. It's kind of who you are at the core. What what was going on there? Why was your dad, even when you were a kid, avoiding the authorities? Mm, there is a strange uh, tradition among uh, Moscow cops that they uh, they're stopping people uh, on the street of Moscow and they're saying that you cannot be in Moscow without like, special registration, which is a total bullshit. And uh, but they're doing it for over two dozens of years because they're uh, they expect that they will find a person who doesn't know about this. And like most of the people, they don't know that cops are going against the law when they're asking for this and mythological registration. And mostly they're uh, stopping people who are looking poor who are people who are coming from and you know the poorer countries like ex um, USSR mm-hmm. republics you know say our um, your, your uh, our version of your um, Mexican um, Im- immigrants sure so somebody from like Georgia or Kazakhstan or something from, like from that. Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan yeah Tajikistan not even from Georgia because Georgia is just too rich and uh, too um, no Georgia it's a western country all the like, after after the revolution mm-hmm. it's not it's not uh, it's not a satellite of Russia anymore but yeah um, and um, and just you know just people who look uh, like they, they might be from other city rather than Moscow and um, my dad hate to deal with cops he knew that they um, it's not legal what what they're trying to ask him but you know they they can bring you all sorts of troubles they they can bring you to police departments and see, since uh, Russian cops are super corrupted they if you start to argue with them and you'll make them mad they can put a weed in your pocket and you'll go to prison for 10 years just wow just because of that so nobody want to fuck with russian cops and um so it's it's pretty rational thing yeah so it's a, it's not just an not it's not an irrational fear it's a rational fear that they're gonna <laughs> make is. your day turn your day to shit so it's like let's just cross the street yeah or your next 10 years <laughs> yeah <laughs> to shit. yeah so my, my father always, or, you know, cross the street or he, like, we, we would never, um, go like, uh, how do you go, hold hand when we walk, like, you no. know, like, no, no, we, we don't, we don't do it because, um, I don't know, we're not physical creatures in that sense with mm-hmm. my dad. I don't know, we just did never hug, we, we never hold hands and stuff like that. So he would hold my hand when he see cop because he... At some point, he started to fear that the, this cop will think that he stole a kid, <laughs> okay. and uh, so this like, this holding a hand should be a sign of me being okay with me walking with this man, my dad. <laughs> so, and I don't think that this fear is irrational because the like, cops really cops from Russia is super corrupted, and uh, the reason why uh, people want to work. Um, in Russian police now because they uh, want 
they they want they're expecting to get a salary because salary is super low. Right. They they want to get bribes. Right, that makes sense. So it's this is your these are the seeds of your early distrust of authority. It, mm. it sounds like. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's he, not just about me. It's about all all citizens of Russia. We hate government. We all hate government. We love our country, but we hate government. I was talking yesterday with uh, one American person. He told me that um, in his mind, there is no such a big um, this, the distinction in, in people's minds uh, between state and country, between government and country. But in, in, in Russia, it's just completely two different things. One one of, it, of them we love and another one we hate. That's interesting. Yeah, in the States, I think we do sort of put the government and the state in one basket. And you see people who are not supportive of the government and people say, how can you not be patriotic? Yeah. But of course, the counter argument is I am patriotic. I'm showing you how much I hate this current government or whatever. And that's kind of what you do in a lot of ways, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, people accuse you of being anti-Russian, but you're more just anti-Putin. Is that fair? It's not like more. I, I am anti-Putin right. and I'm pro-Russian. And in America, recently, I was accused of being Russian spy because I I refused to. I mean, I I, I would never want and and think of being an anti-Russian. Wait, so who I'm, accused you of being an, a Russian spy? Uh, mostly those people who uh, don't. Um. Let me give you an example. When I'm trying to be uh, uh, real and not not living in a, a universe of black and white things, for example, like when I'm saying that I uh, I think that Putin did interfere in um, American elections, but he's not that effective as you think he is, and uh, that I don't think that Putin is the main reason why Trump was elected and there might be some uh, internal issues mm-hmm. like poverty and inequality, uh, like problems with healthcare and education system that might brought um, Trump to power just because people wanted to rage. Um, you know, some some people in America, they accuse me of being a Russian spy. Because yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I don't see the connection there. Or say, like, when I'm saying, like, the uh, Russian pr- prison system sucks, but American prison system sucks too. And uh, they're like, yeah, you sound like Putin, because he all the time he's saying, yeah, but, but Guantanamo. Mm. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah, I suppose there's a difference between... That's not really how spies out. These people know they don't know any real spies. That much is clear. Yeah, <laughs> but it's it's kind of funny the comparison with Trump because I think a lot of people who voted for Trump that I know it, he he's kind of their pussy riot. They're like, you know what? I don't like Hillary Clinton. I don't yeah. like the establishment. I'm going to vote for this guy. I think he's probably just a weirdo reality star, but I'm going to vote for him. So in a weird way, he's like the pussy riot of the United States, where it's like, look, yeah. I'm just going to vote for the wild card, the guy who's going to kick everyone in the nuts. And yeah. It's going to be that guy. <laughs> I know. I had a hard time when I was writing this book uh, about um, how... I was writing that everybody has to take part in politics. And I think that it's good if not professionals will. I, I want to see more uh, unprofessional people in politics because, you know, the experts brought us to neoliberalism, which I don't really like. And then writing these lines, I realized that actually Trump is not, is not professional, but I'm not that happy to see yeah. him in, in power. But I, I think it's still tr- true that it's good to have more unprofessional voices in politics, but uh, I, I guess just Trump has to be um, con- counter, right? What is the English word for, for saying that? He has to be countered. Countered. To... He has oh, to be countered. Count- yeah, countered like by, counteracted. Yeah, but yeah. but by somebody else from our side. So let's say more progressive unprofessionals in yeah. politics. Nice. Well, there's nothing. Lots of us are unprofessional progressives. I'll put it that way. A lot of people hear the name Pussy Riot and they think, all right, what what is this? You're just trying to get shock value. Can you tell us the beginning a little bit of what Pussy Riot is? Because when I, when I was reading in the book and you said you just made it up for a lecture, I was like, there's got to be more to it than that. No, seriously. Not really. No, seriously. We made it up for a lecture. Um, we promised to make a lecture on punk feminism. Uh, Russian punk feminism 
in 2011 and then we realized like five hours before the lecture that there is no punk feminist tracks on Russian and we created uh, this the first track in, in one hour and uh, none of us knew how to sing, how to make music, how to write lyrics for songs and it, we knew nothing about songwriting. But Don't we, worry, we, I think most of the people on the radio <laughs> have no idea about songwriting either. But uh, we decided to make a band as a conceptual art gesture and we were thinking how to call it and we were um, inspired by Riot Girl movement for a while, and um, Riot so, Girl movement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Riot Girl. Yeah, I, I had to look that up when I read it the first time, but it's it's kind of like what it sounds like. What do you mean? You didn't know? No. You didn't know Riot Girl? No. Riot Girl. No, I hadn't heard of it before. Seriously? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Well, look, I'm a former <laughs> attorney. I'm not exactly in the wheelhouse of like cool, cool <laughs> punk kids. No, I I thought it's just it's it's written in American Constitution. This this words I, like I thought it's just, you know, it's like knowing Britney Spears. Britney Spears? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I'm yeah. Maybe I'm the one who's lost on it. I don't know. The listeners will tell me on Twitter where where I've been under a rock, if they've all heard of it. We used to just do like the rehearsing of the music in these abandoned buildings, and like you're talking about being out in the rain on some playground and singing into a tape recorder mm -hmm. with like the battery acid from your speaker dripping down your back. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like legit punk <laughs> slash fully irresponsible <laughs> type of uh, type of scene that you started. Mm, why irresponsible? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I mean, the, the fact that you let your back get burned by battery acid, that was just like, okay, we get it, you're legit. You don't have to hurt yourself. Oh, we didn't want to hurt ourselves. It just it just happened because you 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 have to be effective. And when you're trying to um to go against people like Putin, you you have to be twice effective. <laughs> so it's it's not it's not about fun, it's not about anything like that it's about it's about being tough rough and effective so it, it, it doesn't matter if you if you will end up being um oh, I, I don't know how to say it I, I, I'm, I'm saying I, i've got all english words that's okay so you're kind of saying it as far as i can understand it doesn't matter if you get a couple scrapes on your knees and elbows while you're doing it the point is to be effective mm -hmm. yeah you don't have to look you don't have to it doesn't have to be smooth it doesn't have to be smooth. I, yeah. I, I was living uh, in, in, in this mindset since 2007 when I started to make actions. And uh, we had done lots of crazy actions. And uh, we lived for eight years just only by shoplifting. We didn't have any money. Um, so You shoplifted for eight years to, to survive? Yeah, yeah. That's a long time. You must have gotten caught several times, unless you're Obviously, like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, you have a little bit of money, so say you have, I don't know, like one, no, $50, uh, and uh, you have it for a month. And uh, you think, oh, m maybe in a month you can be caught once, or maybe not. But uh, yeah, you give this $50 as a bribe, and uh, then... Then you go to the next shop because you have to eat. Yeah. Oh, I see. So the the getting the money was the insurance policy against getting caught, and shoplifting was the survival mechanism. Uh yeah. But uh, in order to survive, you need just fifty dollars a month, which is a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> wow. Not. I don't know what part of Moscow that is, but it seems more expensive now. That's for sure. <laughs> it's not. It's not just Moscow. We um we were traveling all around it by hitchhiking and. Actually, we lead pretty interesting life, so it um, it showed me that you can you can live an amazing life without money. It's not like it's an ideal scenario, but if I like at, at that point, I had um, I had to decide between art and uh, working on some boring job for some boring idiot boss, and uh, definitely I I choose to make art and live by shoplifting why dress as clowns or with the masks on i mean you've been now of course you've been exposed to the public but in the beginning you had to hide your identity and i noticed that you'd <laughs> switch sort of to to clowns and the the reason in the book 
doesn't didn't sell me. You said I don't want to scare people, so we dress like clowns. You know how terrifying clowns are for the majority. I think you're better dressing in a balaclava, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, no, I it was a metaphor. It was like metaphor that I I think I was just trying to explain why we don't wear um normal black black clothes. Yeah. But bright ones and uh, aesthetic. Yeah, we want it. Got and it. look bright and ridiculous. Right. So so like clown terrorists or terrorist clowns maybe. No, no terrorists at no. all. Like we never wanted to be terrorists, even art terrorists. <laughs> I don't don't like this concept of being terrorist. <laughs> You're probably one of the most famous Russian cultural exports aside from Tetris, which of course is What the about number tattoo? one of all time. Tattoo? Yeah. I forgot about tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about tattoo. Oh my god, we'll have to link to that in the show notes cuz no one knows what we're talking about right now. Yes, it's just a my, it's just a summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that was my from college. I used to, uh, I had Russian college roommates, so that was blasting at all of our house parties. I had to learn it. Yeah. What are some of the acts that you did? A lot of people know that you make music, but they don't know about, say, the skull and crossbones projected onto the White House. Tell us about some of the things that, that you're more that you think are more maybe some of your impressive pat yourself on the back type of acts that you're surprised <laughs> you pulled off. Um, yeah, Skull and Bones are my f- favorite. Uh, it was on my birthday, 7th of November. It's the day of Russian Revolution, uh, 1917. Uh, so it was my birthday uh, of 2008, and uh, we, we gathered a, a bunch of people, a bunch of activists who were a storming team. and uh, A storming team? A storming team, yeah. And another um, group of protesters who... Um, somehow got big laser projector and uh, we projected uh, across the river in the Moscow River uh, from Ukraine hotel we, we we somehow made it to the roof of this Ukraine hotel just broke the, the door and uh, brought this laser to the roof of Ukraine hotel and uh, then projected this column bones under a uh, parliament building of uh, Russia. It's called uh, it's our White House. And it was 4 a.m. in the morning. And uh, it's beautiful. It's like 60 meters um, wide and tall. Um, it's called Bones. And it was a signal for uh, a storming team. And uh, they had to climb uh, onto the fence, like six meter fence um, that. Um, because the Russian government is really afraid of people, so that's why they decided to protect themselves from the people by, with this uh, six-meter fence. And so our idea was to show the people that actually they tried to protect themselves, but it's not really effective because, you know, just a bunch of idiots, punks, anarchists um, can break through it. It means that a big, uh, big um, like massive crowd can can do it easily um and so we climbed over the fence and just ran in the territory and uh, in in 15 minutes we were gone and uh, just after this 15 minutes cops um were awake not even cops like you know this special security sure. forces of parliament and they started to run around with um um this lights and trying to find us what's going on and uh, they weren't able to find us well they know who it is now they know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I guess it's too little, too late. You made your point at that at that <laughs> juncture. It's funny that Putin is like you. You're asking me now to um, tell about these actions, but uh, and saying that nobody knows about it, but Putin knows them, them really well. Because once he met uh, Angela Merkel in 2012, when we were in prison already, and uh, the first question that she asked was like, "What's up with Pusseret?" And uh, he started to give her a lecture on our art, but it was a little bit, uh, and no, not like he he was he was basing on real facts, but he would completely uh, ch- change their uh, ideology. So let's say that like, we we made one anti-fascist action, and he described the action, and he said that we made it under fascist slogan, and he wanted to scare Angela Merkel with it. Yeah, but he. 
he told her about like five five of our earliest actions which was <laughs> crazy yeah it, it must be how does it feel to have this these world leaders who are in these <laughs> private chambers with their tea and their bodyguards and you're sitting in a russian prison and they're like so these these 25 year old women or however old you are at the time i was 22 <laughs> yeah these 22 year old women they're they're screwing my world up man <laughs> <laughs> Gotta do something about this. Look at how bad they are. <laughs> I, I was really happy that uh, Putin is in troubles because of us. Because they definitely didn't expect anything like that. Uh, after us, they don't put... Um, uh, I mean, they do put... They, they, they put uh, one person uh, who is actionist, who is artist... Do you have this word actionist in English? Actionist? Act- activist, maybe? No, actionist. Actionist. What actionist does that mean? is a um, it's a definition. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, how do you call it? I mean, it's it's a word which yeah. describes a person like a who noun? is making action. Right, somebody who's. I, I mean, I think we literally say activist. It's no, who goes it's after. different. It's, it's more, really different. It's more intense than activist. No, how do you call people like we we are Viennese uh, actionists? How do you call them? Like people who are making, like they know, like people who started. Like action. a revolutionary type person. No, it's uh, they're artists. You know, you know Viennese actionism. I mean, I've heard of that, but I don't know what. They, how do you call them? Like, <sighs> what is the word for them? Because anyway, we call them in the Russia actionists. So okay. I would say somebody <laughs> Google this. You're killing me. Somebody, we're dying over here. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, so uh, Petr Pavlensky, uh, he was inspired by us. He's an actionist from Russia, and uh, he burned the door of uh, FSB building. He burned it? He burned That's like walking door. up to CIA headquarters yes. or FBI headquarters and just like <laughs> lighting it on fire and being like, yo, exactly. here's my middle finger. <laughs> and then he made a photo of himself standing with uh, this oil uh canister yeah and and just being tough as fuck and with this burning doors behind him so they put him in jail Obviously. indeed but they they yeah. had to I, I was i was really scared for him sure. I, I saw that he will end up in jail for like for terrorism for like, sure. 20 years but uh, they let him go after six months and a lot of people told us actually that um, we were the reason why they let him go so easily because they don't want to fuck with um artists and activist actionists anymore yeah there's a m- immediately a spotlight goes on that government when they do in, in part because of you but this stuff is still risky i mean i saw the video at sochi olympics where they were like whipping you guys with uh, was it like a leather whip i mean mm-hmm. it, and, and they're hitting you with sticks and stuff i mean yeah. this is like gnarly these guys aren't like all right kids time to go they're like they walk up right away and start hitting you they don't warn you nothing i mean they're no. coming after you your, what are your parents? Are they not worried? This is more dangerous than ever right now. Mm-hmm. Of course they do. My mother thinks that I need to uh, immigrate, run uh, immediately. Yeah, you still live in Russia. I can't even believe yeah. it. <laughs> she's, she's convincing me that I have to leave since 2014, that since the time when I um, got out of jail. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're one of your bandmates, your former partner. He was just poisoned with something. Mm-hmm. And he's a super healthy guy. He was in intensive care for a couple of weeks. This is weeks ago. And he recovered, thankfully, because he's the healthiest guy in Russia. But, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing would freak me out. You even see Russian activists dying, maybe they're actionists, I don't know, dying in in the UK. You see people getting poisoned across yeah. the world. Alexander Litvinenko getting teacup poisoning. That Does that not make you stay awake at night just a little no i sleep really well <laughs> okay why um it's just i'm 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 healthy uh and uh, you know yeah I'm, i have healthy sleep um no if you're <laughs> asking me if i'm afraid um, yeah i'm asking if you're afraid i'm sh- yes um i am like we, we have different approaches to answering this question because we have different theories on that. Mm. Um, within Pussy Riot, so like, let's say um, Masha's Alekhina theory uh, is that like, she's she's telling that she's not afraid at all. She doesn't have any fears. And, uh, Masha, I think, your bandmate, not afraid at all? No, okay. no, no. And uh, like knowing Masha, I'm 100% sure that it's true. Because she just, I think it's some variation in her DNA. So she she doesn't know like what is fear. She read about it in encyclopedia, <laughs> but I she she doesn't know exactly how to feel. Like she tried, but she she couldn't. Uh, I mean she 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 
actually she does actually she, she kind of tried facebook posts she told me like the only one fear that she has that she cannot post on socials social things like she she's writing um she cannot write about um, her action she asked somebody else to write about her action that's only one fear that she has so she's afraid of posting on facebook but she's yeah. not afraid of yeah. vladimir putin <laughs> yes yeah, she's not or the fsb <laughs> she's not afraid of being poisoned killed or imprisoned she, she's not just facebook posts she makes her really scared and i have another theory about fear i i admit I, i admit that i do have a lot of fears but i i have um my way to um you know channeling these fears working with these fears and i think you will not achieve a lot in our country if you will uh let fear get over you because you know you don't want fear to own you so like, we, we we're in dialogue with my fears all the time but they definitely exist <laughs> that's good at least you're human in that respect right <laughs> i was like I, i i was trying to be like at some point i was scared really i was staying out of russia for like they call almost a year I, i was coming back but i i was traveling so much that i felt like it's more comfortable for me to be out of russia mm-hmm. but it was a really tough period for me because i um I understood it actually is pretty hard for me to be uh to be out of Russia most of the time because it's language is culture it's people they are really brave they're like our community is just insane like the media zona this website that was started after we were released from jail and the journalist who works there reporting on really dangerous issues reporting on abuses of human rights in in, in the most dangerous regions of Russia like Chechnya uh they're risking their lives on a daily basis but and they they're just laughing about it like it's shameful to um, fear and if you're surrounded by people like they who are really brave you becoming more brave by yourself so i feel i feel good in russia yeah i can see that i can <laughs> see you obviously have a network that supports this kind of work and, yes you know there's 10 voices telling you you can do it and, and only your mom and a few other people are mm. saying why don't you move mm. so i can see how you can compartmentalize that one thing that would have scared the crap out of me though and still does even when i read it is is you went to prison in russia for a couple of years how did you tell us Give us a picture of how you got caught and ended up going to a Russian prison. We were not caught uh, right away because uh, uh, people in the church, they didn't really care about us. So we, we made our prayer. They they caught us. I mean, yeah, the guards caught us, but they, uh, they let us go. They, they just told us, like, get out of here. So you're in the church doing kind of doing this disruptive what would you call it like uh performance performance yeah like this disruptive performance of mm-hmm. mock prayer with your brightly colored ski masks on it's not a mock prayer it's a real prayer a real it's just prayer. punk prayer gotcha yeah so the guards kick we you out we didn't want to mock christianity you know we want right. to empower it because we think that the world changed like and with the world christianity should change too in order to be mm, you know still interesting for people because Yeah, you know, including new generation like my daughter, she doesn't want to, like, she doesn't want to go to church like it looks right now. It's just not cool. Mm-hmm. I only want to make Christianity cool again, like it was in the times of Christ. <laughs> yeah, probably it was. It was basically Pussy Riot, circa year zero, right? <laughs> This rebel, long hair, great abs, goes and tells every, people everything they know is wrong. <laughs> He's a punk rocker. <laughs> I'm going to get so much hate mail for this. I just already know. So just stop writing your email right now. I already know what you're going to say. Just leave me alone. <laughs> um, so yeah. you didn't get caught right away. We didn't. No, because it wasn't their job to caught us, to go to, get us to police. They thought we were just a bunch of freaks and idiots, and they forgot about us in in, in, in half an hour. But then we released a music video, and... Um, this v- music video somehow was picked by a um, big Russian television channel. And I think probably through this television channel, somebody from administration of president or Putin himself or Patrick of Russian Orthodox Church, they noticed it and they decided that we actually, we we sick, like, you know, this is a patriarchal thing. They cannot let the girls just come to mm. their place, to their home, to their property and just hold them 
that they're fools, that they're um, they're corrupted, they're not honest with their people. And uh, yeah, they decided to punish us. They opened a criminal case, and uh, in two weeks after the performance, we were arrested. But um, it was really tough for them to catch us because at the time we were activists for um, um, mm, six years already. We knew how to hide from the cops, and for for a week, just dozens of cops were looking for us and yeah. when they caught us finally they were so happy because clearly all this week they were like their lives were really hard because they cannot they just find a bunch of stupid crazy punk anarchist idiotic girls mm -hmm. you're making them look like fools but then you they end up did. As a... it's our profession it is your profession, literally, and you ended up as a political prisoner inside Russia. And this, the stories from the book are are horrifying. I mean, they burned your eyes with some sort of acid liquid. Mm -hmm. I mean, what the hell is that all about? That you're not blind, thankfully. No. But that hurt. Obviously, that was the point, and scary. It hurt. Yeah, it's uh, it's intimidation, first of all, because it was it was really tough for me that was um after a couple of times um they doing it with me i i started my panic about russia and that it was the time when i um, when i decided i'll stay away from russia for like, almost a year yeah it was really scary because i i wasn't a person who um got into fights when i was a kid so like physical space and physical safety zone was really important for me all mm -hmm. the time I, th I think it's really different for someone who was just fighting all their childhood so it's not it's not that traumatizing but yeah. I, i'm the only one kid in the family so like for me my safety zone is sacred yeah <laughs> so i was really just physically scared well they put you in a cell with somebody that murdered two of your friends as well i mean they're like messing with you psychologically as well as trying to to hurt you in prison mm -hmm. So they got you sewing police uniforms and all this. What gives you the strength to go forward when you're worried about, are they going to try to blind me? Are they going to try to beat me up? I mean, they, they were highly abusive to you while you were behind bars. I just prefer not to think about it. Maybe some some people will say that it's not that smart, but uh, again, it's just a com uh, psychological mechanism of me... Mm. No, I, I made a decision that I want to make art in Russia. And if I will think about all that stuff that you just mentioned, yeah. I, I can't, would not be able. So it's the, either or. Yeah, you, it would scare you away. So you're not going to let that happen. So you're just going to say, forget it. Screw mm, it. Exactly. I don't think about it. But it exists. So I... I don't know. It's, it's it's not an easy thing, but life life is not an easy thing, and in the end, you will die. So I just somehow deal with it. I I understood that I'm dying. Uh, I'm dying outside of Russia, because I'm a political artist who whose inspiration is in my politics and my community. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make. Uh, I, I want Russia to occupy the world. I want yeah, but with art. Um, with art, okay. With art, I can yeah. I can live with that part. I was a little scared for a second. I was, <laughs> yes, with art and the end. Like like it was in in the beginning of twentieth century. It was so beautiful. Like our art was in the avant garde of the world art, and uh, it's still uh, it's still possible. I mean, it's still reality because Russian. Rap is just, it's the best, right? Russian, Russian music, Russian rap is it's the coolest. How can you live without Russian rap and listen to just, you know, just American, which I like, I like American rap, but, but I'm saying that there is great potential in my country and in my culture that has to be developed. And I think if all ambitious um, young people will think like oh i will leave russia and i will make my life and career somewhere else then we'll never have the future so i i really uh support those people who decide to stay in russia no and it's really hard to make a career because especially if you're 
anti-Putin, uh, anti-Kremlin person, but there are more and more uh, young people, um, 20, 22, 23, who are saying oh, we are patriots and we will make anti-Putin art and we don't care that, um, you know, we will not will not be as successful as we would move to, you know, London and just uh, study some design and fashion right. bullshit. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, who, who's your favorite American rapper? I got to know. No, I'm not. No, I'll, I'll not tell you. No <laughs> I'll not tell you. Because, because you're embarrassed or because? No, it's too personal. It's too, you, your favorite rapper is too personal? Yes. I know this question is too personal. <laughs> No, my favorite rapper is not personal to me, but you know the the idea that everybody will know what I'm listening to is just oh, you mean you're shocking. Em- you mean you're embarrassed? Um, yes, I think so. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yes. Okay. So you'll show up in the middle of a of a music video in a bra and panties, but tell tell Jordan your favorite rapper. Not gonna happen. Right? <laughs> yes. I'm I'm like Masha in this sense. Like, I feel like I feel like I just can't. This is a fight I'm probably not going to win, so I probably shouldn't ask again. But I now I'm even more curious. My God, is there anybody that you like that maybe isn't your favorite, but maybe like top five? Can you give me a hint. No, Damn. I'm not answering this question. No problem. <laughs> hey, look, I, I respect. Gotta respect your boundaries. You said you learned a lot in prison. In fact, you learned a lot more in prison than you would have in the two years than if you were free. What are some of the lessons that you took from being in one of the crappiest places that humanity's ever devised? Um, I was thinking a lot about Viktor Frankl, uh, and surely you cannot uh, compare my experience with his experience because he was... Uh, literally in uh, death camp yeah. in Germany, and it's quite different. But I think there are uh, mechanisms, like psychological mechanism that he noticed, and uh, something that I noticed. There are similar to some extent uh, that you understand that if you have um, meaning in your life and you have this feeling of. Um, sense uh if you if you find something to live for like helping people around you like thinking about art thinking about art in the future that you will create trying to write something trying to think instead of uh, being turned into a lifeless body like to into a shade uh, of a person who you were before and on freedom um teaches you how to um you know put really meaningful goals for yourself that literally can save your life but the problem <laughs> with all of that uh is that um Dostoevsky pointed it out in uh, idiot uh you promise yourself that if you will be saved and they will not kill you because he he was thinking about it when he when he was on the way to death sentence uh he he said to himself that I will cherish every moment of life after. But he pointed it out brilliantly that you forget about it. Just in, in a month you leave like a normal idiot. Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm trying to rem- remind myself that it's really like to to go back sometimes to those conclusions that I made when I was in prison. And partly that's why I wrote this book. Because and in that sense it's my own um, psychological work, and uh, for some reason, I decided to publish my <laughs> just, just my diary, my psychotherapy diaries. Sure, but don't tell anyone who you listen to in the car. <laughs> but publish all of your prison journals as a book and sell as many copies as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The future you wrote. The future has never seemed so full of and rich and wonderful possibilities as when I was in a labor camp and literally had nothing but dreams. And I think that that's so amazing to be thinking about that while you're getting beaten up by guards, getting fed rotten potatoes, watching people get killed around you who are dying of slave labor, essentially, or the cold. And you learned a ton about yourself in prison. You don't have to be helpless in prison. And little things that you write about seeing green leaves for 30 minutes a day, or the whole summer, sorry, not 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes for the whole summer, summer, yeah, or catching 10 minutes of sunlight once a week and finding joy in that that 
you wrote, was the ultimate act of subversion in finding joy in a refusal to pay and obey in an act of living by radically different values. So you still kind of have this punk rebel vibe in prison, and that's what you credit your that's how you credit your survival. That and knowing you had an army outside supporting you. So after you got out of prison, you visited a bunch of other prisons around the world. And I, I thought that was kind of an interesting choice because if I got out of prison, I don't know how quickly I'd be determined to get into a bunch more of them, at, even as a tourist. <laughs> mm, uh, no, honestly, it's a really great feeling when you're coming to prison as a tourist and you know that you will you can be leave. able to right. yeah, get back to freedom. Um, but the, it wasn't the main reason. The main reason was um, us really going deeply into prison reform issue and we started uh, an NGO that's called Zona Prava or Zone of Justice and our goal was to find a way how to make Russian prison system better and in order to do that we we didn't want to invent a bicycle and we wanted to take a look at how prison system is structured in different countries and when we came to New York we um, met Bill de Blasio, who just became a mayor of New York at that time. And he made really nice reception for us. And uh, he was really kind and sweet and nice. And then he asked, um, like, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And we asked him if we can um, go to prison. And then the next day, uh, he uh, arranged a tour for us uh, to Rikers Island. That's fast. Well, if there's one thing we do in the States really well, it's send people quickly to prison. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but it, it was, um, I don't think it was a real tour. Like, obviously, when, when you go with officials to prison, then mm-hmm. you, you don't see a real side of prison. But it was interesting for us anyway. And then after a couple of months, we... Um, ended up to in Rikers Island for the second time without Bill de Blasio this, um, at this moment. And it happened because we uh, realized that uh, Cecily McMillan, who's Occupy Wall Street protester, uh, she ended up in prison uh, because, because, because of protesting, basically, because the uh, policeman, while arresting her, grabbed her by the breast and uh, she just automatically um, elbowed him. And... Uh, uh, and she, she ended up in prison, not him, though he assaulted her. And she was facing uh, seven years in jail, uh, exactly the same amount of years as we were facing. So we, we just understood that it's really um, this her story mirroring our story. And uh, we talked about her in Washington, in the Senate, in front of all the senators, poor senators and journalists. And then we uh, jumped on plane, went to New York and... Uh, that was the time when we've seen real Rikers Island mm-hmm. with uh, the queue of uh, relatives uh, standing like really long line, um, and uh, I believe we were the only one, well, only one white people in that line. And I remember asking uh, my friend, like, do they, why don't they put white people in jail in in America? And so it was the beginning of my big question and big investigation. Why Why does it happen? Um, so that's America. <laughs> but uh, uh, we we had better um, better experiences in prisons in our countries, in other countries. Uh, in Norway, for example, we ended up on, in Bastoy, which is uh, an island, um, prison island. Um, it contains of a number of cottage houses and uh, eight people live in each house with their own room. And uh, their um, prison warden showed us uh, a special cottage where uh, prisoners can make music, like bass guitars, electronic guitars, um, equipment for recording a song and... Uh, the number of CDs that uh, prisoners recorded while they're in prison. And uh, the same picture in um, Netherlands. And basically, yeah, with Scandinavian countries are known for their uh, really, um, you know, warm, warm um, attitude towards prisoners. And it works. 
For their warm attitude towards prisoners? Yes. It's... That sounds so. If you go to prison in Norway, you end up with a beachfront dacha or cottage and a rec room. The only downside is you got to live with eight other or seven other people <laughs> that you might not know or get along with. Not bad. N- they have normal prisons too. I'm that, sure. I hope that, so. Like not normal, but uh, it's still like they look like. Um, uh, they they don't have cells. They look like normal house. They they're not islands, but it's like normal house with um rooms and uh, every prisoner is in, have has his own room and um yeah but the attitude towards prisoners are so different because it's all about resocialization it's not about punishment and that's why um recidivism is much less in scandinavian countries and europe in general than in america or russia it seems counterintuitive. Why would the attitude of warmth and caring more about the prisoners help people not to go to prison, right? It seems like it might be the other way around. N- not really, because they're, um, you know, the goal of prison is to help people to re-enter the society. Uh, reasons why they people end up in prisons, um, mostly um, they end up in prison because they were growing up in, um, not in a, a really light environment. They were traumatized when they were kids. They were growing up in poor families. They were growing up in family, separated families. They didn't have a good education, so they didn't have a chance to get a good job. They were assaulted by somebody, and so they feel like the whole humanity is against them. So when they end up in prison, they have to they have to reestablish somehow this um, belief that they can work together with humanity, that uh, people are not turned against them. So if you punish them, if you hurt them, if you traumatize them more deeply when they are in prison, they will definitely commit more crimes when they will get out of prison they will come back. That's why in America this rating of um, recidiv- r- recidiv? Recidivism. Recidivism. Yeah. Don't worry, Recid- that, that word's hard for everybody, native English speaker or not. <laughs> Recidivism rating is quite high. Nailed it. Um, you can compare um, America with Canada um, in terms of um, amount of uh, um, crime rating. Seven ta- America has seven times more prisoners than per capita than Canada, but um crime um, rating is pretty much the same. It means that putting more people in jail doesn't help you necessarily to uh, get rid of crimes. So I believe in America it's uh, mostly about um, it's mostly about economy. It's mostly about prison industrial complex. It's, uh, it's about priv- privatized prisons. And uh, as far as I know, um, Barack Obama started to think about uh, reforming, addressing prison question and so when Donald Trump won presidential elections I, um, prison um, how do you call it actions of okay let me help me to phrase it sure. so there is a stock exchange right and right. Um, this actions or like the papers this, the stock the shares the shares can the you... share price of the pr- private prison companies went up can you can you say it instead of me? Because I'm like yeah. I'm, I'm I really suck in economy. No, it's but okay. These I are... know that they got really excited about uh, Trump because right. they they knew that he will not shut private prisons down. Right. So the private prison companies, their stock went up considerably when Donald Trump won the election. Is yes. that what you mean? Yes, that's okay. what I mean. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I'm aware of that as well. And uh, the last prison I want to talk with you about is prison in Germany in Berlin. It's um, important that it's ex Stasi prison, and in this, so former secret police from East Germany. Exactly. Prison. Yes. Um, many people were killed and tortured in that prison, and now it looks like, um, pretty nice place where uh, people can move uh, freely uh, from their rooms to the kitchen, where where they have access to. Mm, plates, knives, food, they can cook. And it's again about resocialization. It's because w- when prisoners are in system like Russian or American, when they don't have access to normal things, they they 
that when they get out of prison after 10 or 15 or 20 years, they have no idea how to live normal life. And uh, the philosophy of mm, prison and that ex ex Stasi prison in Berlin is completely different. Um, they are providing prisoners with um, jobs that can be used later uh, them, uh, by them in normal life. So they would give them a, um, ver various jobs that they can pick, so they, that they can choose. It's not like you have to work, you have to sew police uniform, like it was with me. Like, uh, um, mm -hmm. why? Yeah, you were sewing police uniforms with dull needles. <laughs> why would I need it uh, outside of prison? I, I was trying to uh, let them know that I don't want to... I don't. I don't want to have anything with police uniforms when I'll get out of prison. Actually, it would be much better for me and for my improvement. Because you know, they 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 put me in prison to improve me, like as a human being. Uh, just put me in the library, and I'll improve myself. In two years, I will be smarter, more educated person. Um. Yeah. So in German prison, you can choose if you work if you don't work if you um you can live in the library if you want to and uh, then i started to speak with the prisoners there in russian so that's why i was sure that um you know, wardens prison wardens couldn't understand what we're talking about so mm -hmm. the prisoners were really honest and they, they told me that um you know the biggest the biggest problem that they experienced so far is that they still don't have internet though <laughs> they, were, they were promised to <laughs> have an internet like two months ago and fuck yeah. <laughs> those cops they, they, they didn't get, it's they a human didn't right <laughs> it's a human right I, I, i'm telling you if, if you gave me a choice between running water <laughs> and internet i you'd see me outside catching rain i'll tell you that <laughs> And then I ask like, uh, what what if you if you have an affair? They're like, that's that's totally fine. You can just throw, um, write an application, and they will let you uh, leave and sleep in one room. Unbelievable, yeah. So you're on the prison campaign mission. That's one of your latest yeah kind of causes. I know you wrote that you find yourself in activist depression from time to time, and it almost seems like you get into a pattern of self doubt. It's almost like imposter syndrome, which I've talked about on the show a lot, where people who are really doing something, they start to feel like, oh, well, am I really making a difference? Does this really mm. matter? That happens even to you? <laughs> Is it really? Um, it, it, does it happen not only to me? Really? You're, I mean, you're, you're, you're to... saying that it's a, like, it's a popular problem. Oh, yeah, right? it's a popular it, problem. Yeah. It happens to me a lot. Yeah. I... I just recently started to work with a therapist about this problem because uh, before I didn't believe in uh, like psychological doctors. I, I was thinking that I can deal with everything by myself, but uh, recently I, I understood that it's, it's really hard. Yeah, it's it's not wise to try to solve these problems on your own. We're not really equipped for it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I um I'm getting better. Yeah. So I I would I would advise people to go to therapist from time to time. I think it's interesting that that happens even with you. And one of the common themes on this show is we'll interview somebody who's maybe a Navy SEAL special forces or some politician or a CEO of a big company. And what high performers all have in common is we all have these times where we go, yeah, I'm, what I'm doing sucks. This is worthless. It's pointless. What a waste of time. Everybody thinks I'm full of shit. Exactly. And <laughs> the last time I was doing it, I was on the plane here to San Francisco, so it was like um, Recently, eight hours ago, yeah. Eight hours ago, you had so a bunch of self-doubt creeping in. Um, exactly. Uh, I, I was thinking that everything, what I'm doing sucks, my music sucks, my uh, action sucks, I, I shouldn't be talking in front of people because I cannot tell them anything interesting. Maybe it's true, but, you know, it's not, it doesn't matter if it's true or not, you shouldn't feel these things. You should... They should somehow deal with yourself to um, get rid of it because it's just it it doesn't bring you anything, and it cannot really improve if you're full of these fears. So it's better to start um, acting and you no know, just improve step by step this situation by doing actually anything, doing doing stuff. Yeah, by taking action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel I agree with you here. I think action ends that kind of suffering. And I've said this before, like whenever I feel like absolute crap, I just try to learn something new mm -hmm. or move forward in some way, whether it's a breakup and you feel like you're worthless. So you want to learn a new language. That's definitely happened to me before. Or you just have self-doubt creep in and you decide, look, I'm going to 
figure out what I can do maybe to help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that action just nips it right in the bud. How many languages do you know? Me? Uh, five. Oh, yeah. So you really me. suffered a lot from I, the self-doubt. Thing. That's right. I've got endless amounts of self-doubt. Exactly. <laughs> or just a lot of breakups, right? You break up with somebody, you get some self-doubt, learn a language. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. Yeah, actually, it works like that. Yeah, when uh, when I started uh, when I stopped living with my uh, ex husband, I I really learned uh, English yeah. because he's uh, bilingual, and so I, I I didn't feel like I have to really use English language though I I I knew it, but I was like, oh, I'm shy. I I'll you know I I don't want to talk. You can talk. Yeah, I mean you can translate and yeah. But then I, I just realized that I'm on my own and I have to talk. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't believe that you're shy. I mean, I'm just looking at some of the videos I saw on YouTube. Not really, maybe just shy with English, but certainly not shy in general. No, I'm shy. That's the thing. So uh, art to help you. Like art, I still think that art is the best psychotherapy. I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't need therapy, therapist, but uh, art is the best psychotherapy for me because I was the m- most modest shyest nerd uh, ever well you did at age 14 have a crush on a revolutionary poet which to me says <laughs> nerd times a million yes if you could meet with vladimir putin or talk with him what would you say mm, nothing because i think it's useless don't want to talk with him because i will not change his behavior so n- not even no point in it at all he can hear from you through your art he will not hear from me i don't want to do useless actions yeah, just talking to a brick wall is what we say. That's exactly, the English. Exactly. Yes. That's the English expression for this. We we have this expression too. I just didn't know that you have expression too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Talking to a, it's like talking to a brick wall. Yeah. Ask any married person about talking to a brick wall, <laughs> and they'll have an example for you. What advice do you have for people listening to this right now who maybe they don't live in a free society? And there's a lot of people listening to these in in countries that mm-hmm. are not free societies. What what would they? What advice would you give them? Wait a second, do you imply that America is a free society? Yeah, maybe I'm not. Maybe <laughs> I'm implying the opposite. I don't know. <laughs> That's funny. And like, I, you, you sound like this Freedom House organization right now oh, yeah? in Washington. Yeah, we were making so much fun of these organizations, like, you know, like uh, Republican think tanks that uh. are splitting all globe. Uh, just like, I, I don't know what. How do they decide? So this country is free, this country is not free, this country is half free. I'm like, how do you know? Like, did you ever live in this country? As I was talking with somebody from Cuba and um, the, the taxi driver, obviously we all like to talk with taxi drivers. And he said, like, in a way, obviously politically, the situation sucks in Cuba. But let's say, like, I, I really like to drink while I'm walking down the street, he said to me. And it's completely impossible here in New York when we are, when we had this conversation, but we was like, yeah, you can freely do it in Cuba. So like all your um, you know, liberal bullshit about one country, be f- like the, the, the only one criteria by what you can say if this country free or not, it's not, it's not true exactly. But yeah. So hopefully that's the only question that sounds like Freedom House Radio. Speaking of self-doubt, you got me. <laughs> you kicked me in the nuts on the last question. We got to end on something different. No, I can I can still give an advice. Give advice just to just to people that uh, who are living in the world because I don't like borders in general. So go like, for it. Look, get, throw me a freaking bone here, <laughs> Nadia. Come on. Mm. Try to solve your problems through art first. And um, all people who uh, ask me in America about like what what can you advise us to uh, if we want to go against Trump? I'm not a professional in American politics, but I think art can be really helpful to you because I haven't seen uh, enough. Uh, protest music, enough protest art since uh, Trump was elected. Obviously, I've seen some good things. But uh, I expected to see much more in on 9th of November, two thousand and sixteen. I I thought like in the next few months, everybody would start recording political albums, like Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Taylor Swift. No, it didn't happen. Uh, including 
protest music, on like underground music. I'm constantly looking for more and more political art. And uh, again, I'm not saying that there is no protest art, but I was thinking that it would be like a huge wave of different genres yeah. that became became political, but it didn't happen. So I just try. I, I, I want to see it so badly. Do you think Americans are more passive than Russians when it comes to this or just more pass too passive in general? They're not. No, I, I think it's a question of trend. Is think about punk. It is really cool to make political art. I think it's just it's just not considered as a cool thing to make political art now. So we have to somehow break break this trend. And uh, I think it's just a matter of time. I think a lot of folks might think that what you're doing as an activist seems like really crazy. You know, you're going up and you're getting arrested in a church or you're protesting at the Olympics. Do you think it has to be like that? Because I think a lot of people would make political art, but they think, well, I can't just go and be Pussy Riot tomorrow. <laughs> There's got to be something maybe a beginner step for people to make. We, we're writing music and we're making music videos, which is pretty comfortable and conventional thing to do. So you, you can you can do it too. Simple as that. Yes. <laughs> Nadia, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Hope you all enjoyed that. Remember, most of our episodes are on the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast. You can find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now click here for an interview with Dennis Rodman. Click here for an interview with Moby. And click here to subscribe to the show.